what is the difference between Christians in this generation and the heroes of the faith that we see in the Bible? What is the difference between Abraham, for example, and us today? What makes a man leave his whole family, leave a comfortable home, a comfortable lifestyle, and then go to live in tents and on a journey to a place that he does not even know where it is, a place where he waits to be shown? What makes a man do that? What makes the disciple to leave their livelihoods, to leave their families, and follow this gentleman, Jesus, because he just told them, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What makes a man like Joseph trust God that even though he has been sold into slavery, uh, even though he doesn't deserve to be a slave, even though now he's also been falsely accused and put in prison, what makes such a man to still trust God in the prison, to still represent God in the prison, to still not sin against God, even when he has an opportunity where he, uh, he can do so. What makes a man like the prophet Hosea marry a prostitute and do so just because the Lord told him to do so? What makes a prophet like uh, the prophet Isaiah prophesy naked for three years? What, what gets into a man to be able to, to, to live like that and to do that? What makes Paul, the apostle, undergo all that persecution that he went through in the name of going out to make disciples of all nations, planting all these churches? He is stoned, he is shipwrecked, he is beaten by a snake. He, is, he goes through all this, yet he still pushes on. He says, at the end of it all, I have fought a good fight, I have run the race, I have kept the faith. Now set before me is a crown of righteousness that not only, not only I will receive, but any, everyone who is longing for his second appearance. What makes a human being put themselves in this position in the name of God? The question I'm trying to ask this morning is, what makes men and women to be totally sold out to God, even at a huge cost to themselves? What makes people do anything for God? And what would make people love God with all of their hearts, with all of their minds, with all of their strength, and with all of their soul? This is not a someone series I had prepared to share with us. The someone series we are going through is titled, Are You Convinced? Are you convinced? It's a question. Are you convinced? But this is not a sermon series that purpose to share with us. I have notes for a full sermon series on discipleship that we were going to go through this month. But God has just been convicting me about it and told me, no, just put that aside. I need you to help me answer this question for the congregation. Why? Because sometimes Christianity tends to feel like this huge to-do list. Have you ever felt Christianity is like a to-do list? I need to wake up and do my prayers. I need to wake up and read my Bible. I need to evangelize. I need to make disciples. I need to serve. I need to lead. I need to, I need to, I need to. Have you ever felt Christianity gets to a place it just feels like this to-do list? I'm sure today I'm going to church. I'm just going to be given something new I need to add to my to-do list. This to-do list that we know we have but we really never even go to. We possibly pick one or two things out of those to-do lists. And sometimes Christianity tends to feel like that. They felt God put heavily in my heart to try and answer this question. Is Christianity really a to-do list? And so the sermon series, are you convinced? Through this sermon series, we are going to add something to that question. And so today's specific sermon is titled, Are You Convinced That Yahweh Is God? And we're going to, in the different Sundays, we have five of them. We're going to ask different questions, which will help us conclude, which will help us get to a place where all these things we are doing are not because we have to do them. That all these things that we do to God or for God or because God has asked us to do them is for a different reason. It's not because God needs us to do these things. It's not because God is, is, is less sufficient. It's not because if we don't do it, then all oh, the kingdom of God will crumble. 
God is self-sufficient and he doesn't need us to do anything. So then why do we need to do all these things that we have been called by God to do? A story is told in the Bible about Isaac, his wife Rebekah, and King Abimelech. Now Isaac goes into the, the, the territory of King Abimelech, and because his wife Rebekah is very beautiful, and having learned from his father, eh, Abraham, you remember the thing he did with Sarah? He told Rebekah, when we go into this land and people see how beautiful you are, people are going to kill me for your sake. So when we get into this land, please say that you are my sister. And this is what Rebecca did. Rebecca said Isaac is, his, is, is her uh, brother. But then one day King Abimelech is minding his business, possibly like David, uh, praying into people's uh, <laughs> things when he should not. Possibly he's at a balcony somewhere on his palace. And then he sees Isaac caressing Rebecca. And he's like, wait, what? You, you say this is your sister, but how are you caressing your sister. And because of how Isaac treated Rebecca, King Abimelech understood and concluded that Rebecca was actually his wife. And he called him out on that. If you haven't read that in scripture, please find it is in the book of Genesis. We can all agree that just like in this scenario, we can give people several titles or we can call people different things but they're actually not those things we can know who your child is based on how you treat them we can know who your spouse is based on how you treat them we can know who your boss is based on how you treat them in the same way calling yahweh your god does not necessarily make him god to you what makes him God to you is how you treat him. We can publicize here how we love God. And we can publicize here how, we, how the king of kings, the lord of all creation is our God. But yet on the ground, like Kenyans say, things need different to our ground. And that can be the reality of our relationship with God. That yes, on paper, when we fill out those forms, please state your religion, Christian, in fact in block, letters in fact even you can get a felt pen and just make it as block as you can christian but yet it's just by name it's not in the reality of our lives some because of their actions we can tell that actually they are their own god some based on how they teach money we can tell that money is their god some, their career is their God based on how they cherish and carry themselves as, a, as concerns their career. For some of them, it's their spouse or their children or their health. Something based on how this thing is so valuable to you. So let me answer this question. Who is your God? Who is your God? Before you say Yahweh, because I know we will say Yahweh. Before you say Yahweh is your God, I want you to evaluate your answer a bit further. And instead of your answer being what you think or who you think your God is, I'd like you to answer this question by evaluating your lifestyle. Evaluate your decisions. Evaluate your life and the actions that you do. And see, if somebody who does not know you looks at how you live your life from Monday to Monday, who will they conclude your God is? So it's not what you think, it's not what you profess, it's your lifestyle. If somebody looked at your Monday, your Tuesday, who will they say your God is? It's like a person who tells a shopkeeper, eh, you are, you are my, you're my guy, or if it's a lady, you're, eh, you're my supplier. You, you're the guy who, or you're the lady who, who, who sorts all, uh, who sorts my, my home shopping. If you are, as long as the shop is okay, is here, I am sorted with all my house things. But yet, once your salary comes in or your business revenue comes in, you go to a wholesale supplier somewhere, wherever you go, and you stock up everything you need for the entire month and you have these things in your house. And yet you go to this shopkeeper once or twice just to supplement. You already have the basic of it, and you come to the shopkeeper just to supplement. Yet you tell them, you're the one who's got me. As, in, as long as you're here, I am sorted. 
And even though you are verbally affirming this shopkeeper and saying that this shopkeeper is the one who got you as concerns your supplies for home, that is not the truth. The truth is your wholesaler is the one who's got you, not the shopkeeper. Here is how you know who your God is. Number one, who or what makes the final decision concerning your life? Who or what makes the final decision in your life? Number two, who or what is your first priority in life? Number three, who or what are you living for? I know I'm rushing a little bit because of time, but the notes are going to be availed. So if you go again to the links provided in our church or staff group, in the description you'll find the links and you'll find the notes in there uh, by the end of the day. For anyone to be worthy to be your God, because as we answer those three questions, possibly you're saying, oh, okay, possibly the, final, the one who makes the final decision in my life, possibly it's me, I don't really consider what God thinks, so possibly you're your own God. Or maybe you have some uh, the other question, who or what is your first priority? Maybe it's to have a retirement, and so money for you is a big deal, and money is your God. Or who are you living for? And possibly it's your children, and so in this sense, it, literally, you have elevated your children to the place of God. Whomever you decide to be your God, there are several parameters that a worthwhile God should have. I'm going to mention them quickly. That number one, if you choose a God, this God must be the source and sustainer of everything good. Number two, they must be all-knowing. Number three, they must be all-sufficient. Number four, they must be self-reliant. Number five, they need not to be bound by time or by space. Now, if your answer to the first three questions, that person or that thing fulfills all these uh, five, six things, then they are a worthwhile God. Let me tell you about my God, Yahweh. He fulfills all these things, and not only these things, way much more. I'd like to read a scripture now. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. If you could all turn there and read it together. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. If you are there, please say amen. Amen. I said it on your behalf because of time. I will read it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practices lawlessness. And to God, in the same way, he doesn't look at what we verbally say. He looks at how you live your life. When God looks at your life and looks at your Monday to Monday, what will God conclude? Will he see uh, a resemblance between what you declare with your mouth, that Yahweh is your God, that he is your Lord? Or will he actually conclude that, Possibly you are your own God, or your career is your own God. If Yahweh is truly your God, then you must be doing these things to him, if he is your God. It's like, let me use this example. My wife Alice isn't here. She's ministering at our daughter church. Uh, as soon as I said I loved her so much, but yet... I never did anything to corroborate with that information. I never did anything to confirm my declaration of love to her. I told her how much I loved her, but I never helped out in the house at all. I told her how much I love her, and I don't lift a finger to help out with any bill in the house. I, I say I love her so much, and I never bother to, 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 uh, to, to, to be kind to her or to tell her, they call them the sweet nothings, but they are very important things, to tell her good, beautiful things about her. Will you conclude as a church that I love her if I don't do anything in line with what I'm saying? Will you conclude so? 
tumunisaidia tafadhali ah uh, said oh if i say it in kiswahili you answer i now know ah, i always wondered because i ask in english and then it's ni 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 oh i answer i ask in kiswahili it's well now i know so in the same way we can declare that yahweh is our god but if we are not doing some things he looks at it and says ah uh, i am actually not your god and we will fall in the category of the people in Matthew 7:21 to 23. So these are some of the things that we must do to Yahweh if truly he is our God. That number 1, we will have reverence for him. I feel like teaching us like Sunday school children. So please say this after me that we will have reverence for him. If we don't revere Yahweh, and we call him our god he looks at us and wonders so who, who are you lying to praise the lord we can break reverence down into so many things but you can you can you can do a bit of research on your end because of our time the second thing you must honor him you must do what if you don't honor yahweh and you call him god he looks at you and wonders why are you giving me lip service Truly I'm not your god because you're not honoring me. Number 3, you will worship him. You will do what? If you are not living a lifestyle of worship to Yahweh and you call him God, then he is not truly your god. Because you will naturally worship the one you think is god. You you don't need anyone to ask you to lift up your hands to the one you think is god. you will serve him you will do what you will do everything for his glory you will do what you will love him you will do what and let me just qualify that for us love here is not again deep service it's not just declaring to him we love him it's action he tells us in scripture in John 15:14 what it means to love him he says if you love uh, that's really that's John 14:15 if you love me you will obey me or if Yahweh is your god you will obey him if you're not obeying him he looks at you and wonders why are you calling me god you're not obeying me i am not your god if he is your god you will obey him praise the lord He will be your first priority in life. He will I uh, uh, he will be your what? And because of that you will seek him. Church, we don't do these things because he needs us to do these things. We do these things because we recognize him to be our God. So therefore the question, are you convinced that Yahweh truly is your God? because if you are convinced that he is god and you have accepted him to be god over your life then these things you will do naturally because he is your god the things you will do naturally to your spouse because they are your spouse the things you will do naturally to your child because they are your child you don't need anyone to come and tell you please pay school fees you don't need anyone to come and tell you please buy them clothes you don't need anyone to come and tell them to tell you please get them food you don't need anyone to convince you to do a sermon and tell your parents please feed your children you don't need a sermon to tell to tell you please find the best school for your child you don't need anyone to encourage you guys you don't because you know these are your children but to your neighbors children oh yes then we need a sermon and say okay please it's good to help your neighbors because they are not your children and possibly the lives we live as christians in this nation is possibly because yahweh is not truly our god because we need somebody to come and convince us guys you need to worship god oh you need to seek god you need to do your prayer time you need to study scripture you need to give you need to do all these things and we need somebody to encourage us to do what we need to do naturally possibly so possibly because we don't think and truly acknowledge that he's our god he looks at us and wonders yes you come and sing songs and call me your god if your life depended on something you would guard it with all of your heart possibly people check yahweh casually and the things of god casually because is not that important to us 
Because if, he was, if our life really depended on him, if, if he was truly God to us, oh, then we would guard our relationship with him with everything. If you need someone else to encourage you to have reverence for God, honor Yahweh, to worship Yahweh, to serve Yahweh, to love Yahweh, to obey Yahweh, to have Yahweh as your first priority in life, to seek Yahweh, to do everything for Yahweh's glory. Please do not deceive yourself he is not your God. Now, if you, are, if you don't proclaim to be a Christian, this is very okay. Because you're not even lying to yourself. You know, I'm not a Christian. Yahweh is not my God. And it's okay for you. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to have him as your God if you'd, if you'd like that. But if you confess Christ, if you confess you're a Christian, and this is the state of your heart and life, then possibly we need to take a step back, repent, and come back to the right thing. Why do I say so? If you are in Christ, then Christ's love should compel you to live in a particular way. And if that is not your lifestyle, then you do not have Christ in you. So let's read together this final verse as we end. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Sorry, 2 Corinthians, sorry. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15. I will give us a minute to get there. Let's do get there. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15. If you are there, please say amen. Amen. Let's please read it together. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Let me say that again. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. If you claim Yahweh to be your God, then Christ's love should compel you to do these things. If you find you have no compulsion to do these things, then possibly you're not in him at all. If you are drunk, we don't need anyone to tell us that you are drunk. We will tell, we will see that you are drunk. If we look at your life without you telling us anything, will we be convinced that Yahweh is your God? I'd like to invite us to a time of prayer. All heads bowed down, eyes closed. Like, if this describes you, that possibly you have been calling him Lord and truly he's not your God, I'd like you to repent in your own words right now. I'd also like us to pray for the grace to live a life that is submitted to Christ. To do what 2 Corinthians says, to no longer live for ourselves, but to live for the one who died for us and was raised again. So I'll give you a minute to do that. Please forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, where my actions and words, the motivations of my heart, my thoughts, I have not shown that I have truly submitted my life to you, that you are not truly my God, even though I shout on the hilltops that you are my God, when I sing and I dance. Lord, in the reality of my life, that is not the, the, the true God. Lord, I pray, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. For, in, for everything I have done that has not glorified you. Forgive me, Lord, for where you have you not been my first priority in life. Forgive me, Lord, for where you know, I have not honored you, I have not revered you, and I have not lived in obedience to you. Forgive me, Lord. So I repent again, Lord, and I ask that you restore me back to fellowship with you. That you truly are my God, not only by words, but by actions.
dear Lord Jesus, we also pray together as a congregation that you would give us the grace to live a life submitted to you. Because your love, the, the love of Christ compels us to do so. Not because pastor wants us to do so. Not because our ministry leaders have asked us to do so. Not because our elders have challenged us to do so. Not because people are seeing. No. But because, dear Lord, you are our God and we are responding to you. We are responding to your love for us. So, Lord, give us the grace so that we will no longer live for ourselves. Because if we live for ourselves, if the reason for our existence, our purpose for our existence is us, then we are our own gods. Oh, only way to, we can't even help ourselves. Yet we have elevated ourselves too highly. Forgive us and give us the grace to no longer live for ourselves, but to live for you, Jesus Christ. You who died for all of us and was raised again. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be listening to this recording or watching us online or you're here physically. You have never received Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Now, even if you claim or say that Yahweh is your God and you do all these things and you have never received Jesus Christ, still you do not belong to him because there's only one way to God. Scripture tells us that Jesus is the way, truth, and life, and no one goes to the Father except through Jesus. And some people will say there are many ways, just be good, or you can go through many other. There are no, there's, there's only one way to have God, Yahweh as your God. That is by accepting that you are a sinner, because the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But because God loves us so much, he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins. So that if we believe that he was raised from the dead and we invite him to rule our lives, that then we will be saved. Therefore, we will have access to God the Father so that he can become our God. If you do not do that, somebody has to pay for your sin. And what happens to those who don't receive Christ is they go to hell for eternity to pray for to pay for their sin, and even that will not be enough. There's only one sacrifice that is enough: the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, if you have never received Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, and you'd like to do that, please repeat this prayer after me, meaning it from deep within your heart. Say, "Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins." I believe that you are raised from the dead on the third day. I receive you today to be my savior. I also invite you to be Lord over my life. To come and rule my life. To come and have the final say in my life. From today, I am born again. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and lead me in ways of righteousness for your name's sake. So that when you come back to take your church, I'll be counted among us the number. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've made that prayer for the very first time, please reach out to me if you're here or any one of our pastors or elders or ministry leaders. We introduced them a bit earlier. Please reach out to them and tell them, I gave my life to the Lord today. We'd like to come alongside you and help you navigate uh, this new uh, relationship with God that you have started. We'd just like to let you know that you are now a child of God. The Bible says, for all those who received him, all those who believed in him, he gave them the power to become the children of God. And so welcome to the family of the Lord. You are now a child of God. If you are online, please reach out to us through our different social media platforms and tell us, I gave my life to the Lord. We'd like to do that for you as well. And now I'd like to invite us to be upstanding as we share the final blessing. Our benediction today comes from the book of Hebrews 
chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. This is what the word of God says. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the church said, let's share the words of the grace, remembering that this is a prayer. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And because, guys, we are certain of God's promises of our lives, we confess the words of Psalm 6, verses 23. The word of God, guys, is what carries us through. So we hold on to it. And even if anything else gives us a different opinion or gives us a different perspective, the one we go with is what our God says in his word. And what does he say? Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Regardless of what anyone or anything or any circumstance or your senses tells you, we confess the word of God of our lives and situations. Amen.